All right, so since I still got Adam here, uh, if you don't know, he is a blacksmith and uh, knows a thing or two about steels, obviously. I want to give people a little bit of an, a basic guide to steels because there are so many different steels and it's easy to get confused. So how about we start with the distinction between stainless steels and high carbon steels. So if you're relatively new to sword collecting, you may have read about you know, stainless steel wall hangers, but it's easy to jump to the conclusion that all stainless steel is garbage, which it absolutely 100% isn't. Once upon a time, uh, you had to choose between having a quality blade that could hold its edge and be resharpened, or something that would resist rusting. It was one or the other. As steel technology advanced, that's no longer a question mark. Um, you can now have, for example, some very good uh, blade steels now, such as, you know, S30V, uh, 154CM, and I can give an armful of different names that have fancy numbers to them, but what it comes right down to is, generally speaking, um, you know, blanket statement, the difference between a high carbon steel and a high carbon stainless steel is most often chromium. You can add 12 or 13 percent chromium and get typically a high carbon stainless steel, provided you don't change the carbon content. Mm -hmm. um, you can also get a number of other alloying elements that will increase corrosion resistance. Now, in terms of swords, it's all about what you're wanting it. If you're wanting it to be a beautiful display piece, then absolutely go stainless. However, if you're wanting it to be something that's going to hold up well for usage, then you want to lean toward either a medium or high carbon steel. Uh, the higher the carbon content of steel, the better it can hold its edge, the stronger it's going to be, but as a rule, it's going to be more, corro more, more corrosion likely, so it'll have a better chance of rusting, and it'll also be a little bit less forgiving of impact if it hasn't been heat treated right. Whereas if you go for a lower carbon content steel, you can abuse it to high hell, but you're not necessarily going to get a very good edge retention out of it because it can't. Nowadays, some of the hardest steels you can get are actually not the straight carbon steels, they're the high carbon stainless steels, mm -hmm. because chromium and other elements that go into uh, steels to make them stain resistant often have incredible wear resistance, strangely enough. And as such, they can be a pain to resharpen once they do go blunt, but they can achieve very, very high hardness. The reason why we have so many different very high quality steels is that each one's more suitable for certain applications. So if you're using it as a pocket knife, you want an incredible edge retention, then something like, you know, an S9V or an S110V is not only great, it's overkill. Whereas if you want something that's gonna hold up to a fair bit of shock, can you use it, you know, as a bush machete or whatnot? You don't need that. You'd be just fine with any of the higher carbon steels like 1075 or 1084. And sure, they can rust if you neglect them, but they worked well for decades for a reason. Whenever you hear words like, you know, 1095 or 5160, uh, the first two numbers, that whenever we say them, denote the kind of alloy composition. And then the first two or three numbers after are parts per 100th. So 1095 is 0.95% carbon, so almost a percent of carbon per mixture. And it's a simpler steel, which means that there aren't a lot of alloying elements in there that can kind of catch up or bind energy, so they actually can be quite tough despite the fact that it's a higher carbon content steel. It's just there are fewer things getting in the way. If you have a, a blade that needs to withstand a lot of impact stress, mm -hmm. you know, like heavy chopping, things like that, you want the carbon content to be not too high. Lower end would be 1045, which is, I mean, can be good. It, under the right conditions, it depends on what you're using it for. Basically, it'll be more shock resistant, but it's not gonna be the best edge retention. If I'm gonna go for something for a lot of shock absorbency, I'll be leaning toward 5160. It's a wonderfully abusable steel that you can do a tremendous amount with. However, the steel is the starting point. It really does all, all come down to heat treat and blade geometry because I've seen some really remarkable things from blades that, based on their steel, should not have been able to hold up. Mm -hmm. But it's all about how it's finished because depending on how the blade geometry works, it'll either excel at your intended purpose. It's generally good if the, the maker gives you the hardness. Mm -hmm. So if they tell you this has been hardened to, you know, it gives 55 you a HRC, Rockwell, then you know it's, it's going to be in about the right range. Yeah, so, yeah. again, the range depends very much on the purpose. So, if you give people a few examples of, you know, say, a, let's say a falchion, something for heavy cutting, mm -hmm. chopping. I'm going to recommend something in the range of 53 to 54 at the most for the falchion, just because most of the time when you're using a falchion, you'll be facing uh, armored opponents, so you're going to be impacting stuff that's hard, and you want, ideally, 
an edge to either roll or slightly deform rather than chip out if there's going to be edge damage. And we're talking in, you know, battlefield kind of situations, so there's going to be edge damage. You can get away with a much higher uh, edge hardness if you can use other elements within the same steel. A good example of that are uh, some of the Japanese blades because in those you've got different uh, steel mixtures within that so you can have a progressive hardness and you can also get that the old way by using a differential hardening or differential temper. Most blades nowadays are what's done with what's called a mono temper, so it's the same hardness all the way through. So in terms of edge damage, if we're looking at something like this, uh, here the edge deformed mm -hmm. and uh, this you can you can probably hammer down again. I mean there's a chance of that it, it'll be damaged but um, you can fix that more easily. If this was actually a chunk missing then you would have to reprofile the entire thing if you want to avoid that or just kind of live with it and cross your yeah. fingers. And, and also uh, if you have nicks in, or, or gouges in there that also increases the risk of the blade breaking at that Very point. Very much right? so because it creates a point where force can come through at an angle you don't want. Because the blade's designed to, be, for the most part, take force perpendicular or straight on. It's not liking it if something catches and gets stuck there mm -hmm. and then you've got, well, you don't have the reinforcing backing you're after. So again, in terms of hard use blade, it's definitely better to have it on the tougher, softer side, so deformation you can deal with. Or for example, also if the blade bends and takes a set overall, as opposed to just snapping in half, mm -hmm. it's obviously can't fix that. Yeah, if you have to err on one side, err on the uh, more shock absorbent side. 1095, many people tout it as a beginner steel, and that is both true and misleading, because in order to heat treat it right, um, you have to do a few things, but you can get a lot out of it if you know what you're doing. And 1095 takes a differential heat treat really nicely because mm -hmm. it's what's called shallow hardening steel, and you can get not only a beautiful wispy effect on it, but if you do it right, you can control if it's you know hard at the edge, soft as you progressively get further back. But you can harden that to reasonably low on the Rockwell scale, or sitting, you know, around 60, which, give you an idea, that's where a lot of Japanese uh, kitchen knives are sitting at, and those are designed to cut sashimi, they're designed to cut vegetables, and they don't really encounter bone too frequently. Things like grain structure are also... They play a humongous quality. factor. Um, when you're making a blade, at least if you're making a blade where you're heat treating yourself, it is strongly recommended that you normalize the steel, which refines the grain structure. And if you do that prior to doing the hardening, what you have is a very clean uh, grain structure, because the, the finer and more consistent the grain structure, the less likely you are to have any kind of imperfections or impurities during the heat treater places where stresses are built up. And the tighter the grain structure, you also get a longer lasting edge, because the edge comes out that much more cleanly, because when you heat treat it, well I could go on for a while, but the point is, grain plays a huge deal, and if you have too large of a grain, or too inconsistent of a heat treat, even before you go to the tempering, it becomes a nightmare to work with because it won't last. When we're looking at the higher end stainless steels that you can use for knives, mm -hmm. you can um, temper up to like 62 HRC in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, those are obviously very high quality steels for knives and uh, they work perfectly. Why are they not suitable for swords? The reason why they're not suitable for swords is because you don't really, you really don't want that level of hardness on a sword. Mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with very different forces. A knife is going to be used for anything from uh, careful, I hope, prying of things, or you know, general purpose cutting. You're not typically going to be applying the same forces to a knife that you would to a sword, which can sometimes be used like a chopping object. It's just going to end up chipping or, worse yet, snapping if you put it through the rigors that classic swords are going to were expected to face. And that's even true for specialist blades with a very hard edge. You buttress that by having a softer spine. Well, in this case, the higher end stainless steels are most often the same hardness all the way through, uh, even when you make them in larger form. So it's not ideal as you get to heavier impact uses. Also, they're very expensive when that's mm. in that kind of stock. So even if you were to make everything work out exactly right, you'd see a token improvement over the straight carbon steels for a tremendous increase in cost. Because the stainless steels, that will hold up really well. You know, as a bladesmith, they're very expensive to buy. Because we've come so much further in the way of uh, steel technology now versus 50 years ago, it's not even funny. So could you technically make one of the higher end stainless steels work by just tempering it down to, say, 55? 
It is possible. Um, it would be a bit tricky because the higher quality stainless steels require very specific tempers and they require different temperatures than mm -hmm. most of us can achieve in a controlled fashion. Mm -hmm. And when, you're com when it comes to doing a differential hardening or differential temper, you do rely upon whether it's uh, an infrared laser to see the right temperature. Um, you can do it the old way by eye, or you can have a, a kiln set up for it. And with the higher, car higher high quality stainless steels, you almost have to go through a kiln because the temperatures mm -hmm. you need are not something you're going to be able to easily get through a torch and you can't rely upon it being held in the blade. Mm. So basically even though it is a simplification to say that stainless steels are not suitable for swords, it's it, is, it is a good rule it, of thumb. Yeah, it's possible it's just ludicrously unrealistic to do that instead. So basically it's safe to say that if you see something on the market that doesn't cost a couple of thousand or who knows what <laughs> and it says stainless then you want to stay away from it. Yeah, if you wanted to use it. Uh, once in a while you'll see someone who does a cladding on a blade where, mm -hmm. let's say you got a 1095 or 1084 uh, steel and then you see someone cladding it or wrapping it with a uh, stainless steel. Usually in those cases it's going to be a lower carbon content one like a you know, three, uh, th 304 or 420 even. Then wh what you have basically is the edges are vulnerable to corrosion but the rest of it's fine. Mm -hmm. But it's just basically putting a protective shell on it. Do you have any specific recommendation for a an affordable, like the, basically the best affordable steel for a sword? Uh, to be frank, it's hard to be 5160. Mm. Uh, 5160, 1060, 1070, that family are, they're very good steels, they're very easy to work if you know what you're doing, and they're very easy to learn on because you learn, you learn rather quickly uh, what temperatures they like to operate at. Mm -hmm. And they're very forgiving as well if you get the heat treat slightly off when you're, if you're doing it, say, um, you know, in a shop, you haven't done it before, you don't have a whole lot of practice, but you've, you've got a safe environment set up and you're wanting to make a sword, you want to do it the old way, you can do far worse than those steels. Uh, if you go to some of the higher carbon content steels like 1095, the chance of catastrophe, if you're unfamiliar, jumps up considerably because if you go too high of a carbon content and you quench it uh, either in the wrong medium or too rapidly, you don't really have the room for error that you do with some of the medium carbon steels. It's more likely to shatter. If the goal was just historical accuracy, you can actually reasonably decrease the quality of the steel and say, well, that's what they have. I mean, there was a massive range of hardness. I, I found a a chart that shows you some samples that they took from I think another swords. one. And yeah, and it's, it's drastic. It's anything from basically too low to even be on the Rockwell C scale yeah. to, I think they went over 60. Yeah, and the primary reason for that was the inconsistency of the steel itself. And again, the steel we have now is so much better than what we had 50 years ago to say nothing of a thousand years ago, it's not even funny. Um, the reason why many times people would have to refine the steel through the folding process or by adding a diff uh, different steels to it is, as was mentioned in the Pattern Welded Steel video, Effectively, what you're doing is you're trying to make, for lack of a better term, a homogenized mix of the impurities and carbon content because it's very much like if you're kneading bread, if you're baking bread or just you know making up the dough, when you get too much flour in one spot, it'll break the thing apart. And likewise, that's the exact same thing that, ha same thing that happens when you have a clump of carbon in a steel mixture. But likewise, if there's not enough spread out evenly, it's not going to hold the shape. And that's the exact same way that carbon content works in uh, iron steel mixtures. To sum up, if, if you just want one takeaway, you know, if you're looking for steel, if you want to play it safe, I think we could just say 5160. 5160 is... or 1060 or 1070. They're all very good steels that can perform quite well. And you can do far, far worse. <laughs> But even then, even if you know that there are, it does depend on the maker. So you have to go by the reputation of the maker to a large extent, because you can have, you can start out with excellent high quality steel and mess it up by incorrect heat treatment or basically failing to heat treat it at all correctly mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. So it always depends on the quality of whoever is working with the steel as well. Yeah. We all have that one friend that can somehow burn water. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, um, I will link the um, 
Callum's Etsy store down below. If you ever have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. All right. So thank you for helping out with the video. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for watching. Hope you found it helpful and have a good one, folks. Cheers.